Hello everyone and welcome to another video on creating a metadata driven processing framework for Azure Data Factory. In this video I want to share with you and demonstrate a new feature that's been added to the processing framework in version 1.9 whereby we can now hit and execute our worker pipelines across different tenants and across Azure subscriptions. So to expose that scenario and to think about that what we have already been able to do within the processing framework if we have that data factory running in a particular Azure environment somewhere we can decouple those worker pipelines from the data factory that's actually doing the, the main orchestration the data factory that contains the parent child infant pipelines can be separate to the data factories where our worker pipelines live. So we could already do that. Um, and what's now been added is the capability to take that one step further. So not just decoupling those worker data factories from the main one, but also if we want to decouple those worker pipelines into different subscriptions as well within our Azure environment. And then lastly, of course, to complete that picture, we could, if we want, now decouple them from uh, the same Azure tenant. So we can now reach across Azure tenants and actually authenticate against that target data factory where those worker pipelines live and execute them as part of the framework. So if you're a, a multinational corporation that has you know, localized operating companies in, in different countries or whatever, they might have their own tenants and subscriptions. You could now, if you want, have a, a complete umbrella orchestration service using the framework that reaches to those disparate tenants and, and accesses those worker pipelines and tells them to run as, as you need them to. So what I want to do for you is actually just demonstrate that behavior. So let's Firstly, um, I think jump into the, the database. Let's just look at how the database has been extended to support this capability. So what we have um, in here in our metadata database is what we, we started with our data factory uh, table and our pipelines table. So where we could already define where those workers were going to be. What we've done is, as you can see, added the subscription level metadata on top of that in terms of a hierarchy. You know, we're, we're working our way up. And finally, the tenant table um, is now there as well, present within the, the metadata database. So two more bits of metadata that we need to populate uh, in order to get this cross tenant execution and, and behavior. All of which, of course, is, is completely optional. You don't have to use this, but you do need to tell the framework uh, or give it at least one set of tenant and subscription information. In terms of what that metadata looks like, if we jump into Management Studio, and I'm just going to query those first four tables that I showed you in the uh, database diagram. Um, if we inspect this metadata and, and forgive the, uh, the cautious var binary conversions here, just so my actual tenant IDs aren't exposed. But what um, you can see is I've got um, two tenants in, um, in my first table, my, uh, my normal tenant that I use for development, mrpaulandrew.com, and uh, this other tenant, the procframework.com tenant. Then, description level of our metadata, you can see that we have this one-to-many join between the tenant and the subscription. Um, you know, if we have multiple subscriptions within a tenant, that's certainly possible. Um, and similarly for this demo, I've, I've got that second tenant, which has that join to that uh, other subscription as well. It's all one-to-one -one for, for this demonstration, but you can appreciate it could be one-to-many. Next up, our data factories table, which we had before, but you can see it's now been extended with that subscription information. So we can then make that join 
between uh, a data factory, a subscription, and then the tenant at the top level. And then of course, the last level is our pipelines table, which we had before. Um, and you can see that for my uh, factory ID one, I've got uh, four worker pipelines that are going to be called. And then uh, for this other uh, data factory, I've got one worker pipeline. So we've now got that hierarchy of metadata right the way from the pipeline level all the way up to the tenant level. And we can control those workers if we want to in that way. The last thing that we have at the very bottom, which I, I've just included here for completeness, is the uh, service principles table. So as we already know, a service principle is linked to a given worker pipeline. So we can have that very granular execution of a, a single service principle per worker pipeline if we wanted to. And that is obviously more so uh, true now that we're using separate tenants as well. Um, so I've got two service principles um, as a minimum because I have two tenants here and, and two worker pipelines uh, in, in those tenants. So my first service principle allowing me to authenticate against that first tenant and the second one uh, allow me to authenticate against the pipelines in that other tenant. So that's my metadata. If we now turn our attention to the uh, data factory pipelines themselves, so within the um, parent, child, and infant pipelines that were there, there's quite a lot of refactoring that's had to be done to support this. What was uh, previously the case that the uh, Azure subscription and the Azure tenant were retrieved from the metadata database in the parent pipeline. That no longer happens. Um, so the parent pipeline has had those activities removed. Um, similarly, the child pipeline that was quite large is, is now very small uh, and is just responsible for the scaling out of the, the worker executions. That information to retrieve the service principle has also now been removed from the child level. And because we're now doing this cross-tenant call to the workers at the lowest level, we've had to push down all of that metadata behavior right the way down to the, the worker pipeline, um, which you can now see here in this new refactored infant. So what the infant will now do is it's not only responsible for the completion of the running worker, it now takes care of the execution of the worker as well, using that first Azure function to, to call that pipeline. Then to the left of that, we have um, two lookup activities. The top one being to get the authentication information for that worker that we're going to go and hit. Uh, and that gets passed off to a set of variables. So we have now variables here for those four pieces of information to authenticate the tenant, the subscription, the service principle ID, and the service principle secret. So those are, are got now at the infant level, so we can hit that worker pipeline. Then the other lookup for, for completeness, we have one that gets details about the pipeline it's going to call itself. So what's the resource group? what's the target data factory and, and what's the pipeline name. And, and those similarly get set into a bunch of local variables to this pipeline. The variables are used if you're interested just so we can avoid repeating expressions in our downstream activities. So instead of having a expression that says take the output from the lookup activity over here, we can just put all of those values into expressions and it means that we can reuse the variables in those downstream function body requests and things like that. So this is, a, as you can see, the new refactored infant pipeline with that behavior now pushed down at the lowest level. What it does actually also mean, if you're interested, is that for a given execution run, if you want to do something with debugging or checking um, your pipelines, it means the infant's now quite nicely decoupled um, and isolated for the execution of that worker. So you can see the parameters that the infant now accepts is, is a lot less than what it was. 
we just have the execution ID, the stage ID, and the pipeline ID. So providing only those three sets of information, you could in theory run a, a single worker in isolation and all of that other metadata is taken care of for you. So let's see it in action. Um, so to, to prove there's no cheating, what I'm gonna do is um, I'm just gonna launch a, a private browser window um, and I'm going to log in to the Azure portal uh, and I'm going to connect to my my target tenant where I've got that uh, that other worker pipeline, just so we can actually see this thing running. So in this other tenant, um, I only have one resource deployed, which is a, a data factory, um, and then we can go into the uh, monitoring and authoring area and what you'll see when it loads is just a single worker pipeline, which I've just called wait 99, um, and a single wait activity. So the, the very same pattern that I use for the worker pipelines in my development environment for the, the main uh, data factory. Uh, this pipeline has a parameter for the wait time, which is passed to the wait activity. Again, very similar pattern. So just a, a, a dummy worker pipeline, basically a dummy worker pipeline that does now exist in a separate Azure tenant. So let's put that side by side with my main data factory. So this data factory is both doing the orchestration um, execution and also running the four worker pipelines that I had in the metadata. And then that one worker pipeline will be called uh, across to that other tenant. So I can trigger my parent or grandparent in your case, uh, as you prefer. And what we can do is we can go to the, the monitoring screens. Um, we've got that parent running. And what we could also do, of course, is flip back to the database and look at the current execution table. So I've only got uh, those five pipelines enabled. It's not gonna do anything else. Um, it's all happening with a single execution stage. So we are calling different tenants in parallel in theory. Um, if we just get a bit closer on this, you see the first four workers in the tenant where the orchestration framework's running, and then that fifth worker over in that other tenant. So let's hit refresh. Um, we have a, a running status on four of those. We should have a running status on the fifth. There we go. As you'll uh, probably know if you've watched my other videos, I, I say to you that the more times you hit refresh, the faster it will run. This is absolutely true. So hopefully we've got some very small weight parameters that have been passed. Yeah, nine seconds, one second. So this isn't gonna take too long to run. Um, if I jump back to my monitoring portals, um, I'll hit refresh here. So we've got the orchestration pipelines. We've got those five infants that have been spawned, four of which are, are used within the same data factory for those workers. And then, of course, that fifth one being used over here in my other Azure tenant to uh, to hit that which uh, it has now done. The previous one was when I was trying this before I did the recording. So that's all good. So actually let's minimize that and just maximize this one. So the infants have returned bar one. Maybe that one's just dragging its heels. My workers local to this data factory have completed. Let's have a look what the database is telling us. Okay, we've got successes all round, so we're just waiting for that last infant to finish tidying up. Must probably go for another 10 seconds if it's just hit that last sort of check status and, and retry behavior from the until activity. There we go, 
So yeah, that infant's now succeeded. The child has now returned successfully as well, and so is the parent, which should mean my table is now empty. It is. So um, a very simple demonstration really of, of using the framework and nothing really has changed too much about doing that. Just the fact that we are now reaching across tenants and we are now getting that cross tenant behavior um, that I talked about. So if you have that requirement where you need to reach across tenants and, and reach across different subscriptions, um, we can now achieve that using this pattern and, and using this framework. So that was it, everybody. Thank you very much for listening. I'll see you soon.